Good to go. Good to go. Let's give it up for us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, before I start, I would like to ask for one thing. Uh, who are those managers? Raise your hands, please. I am going to reveal something about those managers at the end of my talk today. My name is Aras. I work at a company named Cloya. Uh, we are a DevOps transition um, consultancy. We have offices in London and New um, in, um, in Istanbul. And because we're a consultancy company, we run into particular types of clients every now and then. They come, at, come to us and say, yay, we're very excited about DevOps, so let's do DevOps things. So we say, that's great, let's talk about tools. So we talk about tools, and they say, oh yeah, you know, Jenkins and Kubernetes and Docker, like, we know all of that stuff. So that's a good sign, because they're excited about a particular part of this transition. So we start talking about processes. And they're like, yes, you know, we know about microservices, we know about CI, CD, we know about automation, that's awesome. So we are very excited because there's someone who really wants to make a change, so we start talking about processes, and, uh, culture, and this is the reaction that we get. They're like, can you like not touch anything? You know. And we feel exactly like you do, it's like, okay. And then we think, maybe like, we're doing this wrong. So over and over, we realized that it wasn't just one customer. It is the norm. Everyone thinks that by just setting up Docker, you become completely DevOps enabled, and you are done with your transition. So we thought, we need to do something different. What if we actually go to them and say, well, your approach is right. You're very, you know, very nice, but there are other things that you need to do for a successful DevOps transition. So we go to them and say, well, here's the data that shows the importance of a you know, holistic view and how it impacts companies. We present data from our work, we present data from different case studies, and the, re and the response that we get is, so Jenkins? <laughs> <laughs> and this did not really solve the problem. So we, we thought, well, I have a design background, and design is all about understanding user needs and creating solutions to meet those needs so what if we use design methods for this DevOps transitions? But when we say design, this is what most people think. <laughs> and it is actually, there's a truth to this, because design is, make, is about making things look nice. And by, and by making things look nice, it creates a more pleasurable experience, it improves the user experience, and creates an overall more pleasurable use throughout the time. But making things beautiful is not the only function of design. design also makes things work better. This is a very classical example of very good design. Um, this is a potato peeler from OXO, which you m probably um, have like one at home. And it was created by a designer who saw um, his wife struggling with the thin uh, potato peelers because she had arthritis and couldn't hold on to that object. So he worked to create a much better potato peeler that solved that need without having to go and you know, um, do things over and over. Um, good design makes software usable so that it becomes invisible as we use it. Good design makes things more visible. It helps us navigate um, to places. Good design matches the, co uh, the contextual model of the, um, of the users. As a good example, there's the, um, the car seat adjustment um, on a luxury car, which actually looks exactly like the, uh, like the seat, so that you can map your mental model directly onto the control without having to think about that. So design makes things look good, design makes things work better, but at the very highest level, design reframes questions, design reframes problems. <coughs> yes, Uber is great for um, getting, a, getting a ride, but it is actually rethinking the way that um, urban transportation works. Airbnb is kind of a hotel, like it gets you uh, a very nice, um, very nice room, probably at a better rate, but it also is a rethinking of hospitality industry overall and what it means to be a micro merchant with a, with a spare room that you can rent to others. Starbucks does sell coffee, but it is not about coffee, it is about turning urban spaces good or bad, into community hubs where people can hang out and have conversations over coffee. And there are many, many good examples of this where um, innovative companies use design to reframe problems, to solve much better things and have a much larger impact. So when we say design, this is the much larger picture that we mean. And 
in that picture, the most important part are the humans, are the users that are going to be using whatever you're creating. So we looked at this and identified five things that great designers do to create amazing user experiences. First, good designers work directly with end users. They don't work with representatives. They don't work with the managers. They don't work with, for God's sake, product owners who think that they represent the users. They go directly and work with the users. They do user interviews. They work through the tasks with them. They hang out. Um, they spend time, quality time, face-to-face -face time with them on their site. They do usability studies to understand what the problem is. And in taking that, they can keep the focus on the user throughout the, uh, the project itself. Second, good designers welcome ambiguity. Design is all about creativity and alternatives. And at the early stages of designs, this is very important. Um, this is a very simple sketch, and most people who are drawing may recognize this. When a good designer looks at the first one, he or she may look into the progression and see the, last, uh, see the, um, see the end, um, end result. And also, the fact that the first sketch is incomplete does not bother a good designer. So they're okay with ambiguity. There's a very good example from this, um, from a um, very successful um, architect um, named Zaha Hadid. This is a sketch that she made for a museum, and this is the actual building. So by welcoming that ambiguity at the very beginning, she creates that potential of creativity that carries on to a much better vision and a consistent implementation of that vision. Third, good designers give form to ideas. They don't only talk about ideas, but they actually give form to the ideas. They build things. This is an example from Ford, where senior designers like studio directors build a full-size um, Ford Mustang from clay by carving it by hand, so that they can actually feel and walk around the car and see how, it, how the experience is before they complete it. This is obviously very easy to do for physical things, but you can also do the, um, these for um, digital experiences and services. There's a um, tool called um, customer journey mapping or service blueprinting, where you take every single touch point that you expose to the users and walk through it. They, you diagram it um, to see how um, users are using the product that you're building for them. Or there's a tool called personas, which are research-based methods that summarize the type of users that um, you're going to be interacting with. There is something that is very important about giving form to ideas because of the ideation process. There are many times when we could not get criticism, and I, we, we, we heard a fantastic talk about that. If we, when we give form to an idea, we externalize it. So the discussion shifts from who the idea came from to the idea. So this is a very critical um, uh, process in uh, creative uh, endeavors. The fourth thing that good designers do is that they co-create in a safe setting. How many people have been in a design studio before? Have participated in one? I see one, I see a few hands. That's great. Design studios are collaborative um, settings where designers, business people, and everyone who is involved, not only designers, work together to solve a design problem. And when facilitated correctly, they become this really flowing collaborative um, activity that creates amazing results. Critique is very open. People are open to receiving and giving critique. And at some point, it gets so natural that people start completing their uh, peers and complete work, and they welcome the fact that someone is actually walking up to what I have drawn and you know, fixing that. So, and doing this in a very safe space is a critical part of um, good design experiences. Finally, fifth, good design is about experimentation and revisions. Um, when, we say, um, when we say design, one of the things that come to mind is this myth of the creative, right? You have to be left alone. Well, these creatives need to be left alone. They drink like weird coffees. Most of them use Macs. They have like weird tattoos and you shouldn't talk to them because it will like create imbalance in their like thought process and whatever. Uh, this may be correct for art. This absolutely does not apply for design. Every single product that we use today is a part of experimentation and small improvements. Small failures and improvements from software, from physical products, from <laughs> services. You see the peeler here. Everything that is designed well has not happened overnight. It is a case of experimentation, revision uh, over cycles and cycles. So with these five principles, good designers go out to the field and say, well, you know, here's my, here's my approach to the project. And by adopting these, 
they keep the user needs at the center of the project at the beginning, and they are able to do that throughout the project. Now, I look at this, and then I look at the way that we start DevOps projects. Most of the projects start with, show me your architecture. What is in your stack? What tools are you using? And this does not get us to a deep level of understanding. That is why I'd like to share with you today two example companies that we worked slightly differently and um, tell you about some of the learnings that we had. So the first company that we work with is Ishbank. It is the largest private bank in Turkey. Um, 25,000 employees, um, more than 1,000 um, uh, branches. Um, in terms of asset size, they're roughly between um, ABN AMRO and the Volksbank here. And the other company that we work with is Huawei, um, the big Chinese company. We work with their Turkish branch. Uh, 1,500 people working in integration and R&D. And unlike the previous projects that have failed, we did not start with sending out surveys. We started with face-to-face -face interviews. We actually sat down with the people that we're working with, gave them space, and asked them honest questions about the problems that they're having at work, whether it's technical or whether it's something else. And by doing that, we were able to give them space to tell us stories that we wouldn't have otherwise heard. It also helped us to create a personal connection to them so that, like designers, we walked and got the problems from the first end from the people that are experiencing them. The other thing that most people do when they start a transition project is to look at the process. And when you ask a department to show you their process, you either get an outdated PDF file or you get a 60 megabyte Visio file that just doesn't work. And moreover, it is not the whole process, even if you ask the whole process end to end, they, what they give you just outlines one or two silos in, in very little detail, and you don't see anything else. So instead of doing that, we gather everyone in a room and conduct collaborative uh, process mapping workshops. Um, um, value stream mapping is one popular method that we use here, but we use other things as well. The task here is to lay out every single thing that happens from the moment when an idea sparks in a manager's head, in an investor's head, all the way down to the fact that it gets into production and then explodes in production. So we see entire flow. And in doing that, a lot of people realize that there is someone else in the room who they did not know that they were in the process. They go like, oh, I didn't know that it was your team who did that. Or like, ah, oh, it was then you who is coming in? So there's a lot of discovery going on there. And by doing this, we help people externalize their problems. And once the bottlenecks are clearly identified on the boards, it is much easier to discuss those without pointing fingers to each other. Another thing that happens um, in, the, um, in the consulting space is this particular type of consultant who loves reading the Dora reports, who loves reading blogs, but actually doesn't do anything. And when you are asked for their opinion, they say, this is the best practice, completely out of context, without really understanding what your company is doing. So instead of doing that, we sit down and conduct challenge mapping workshops. This is a structured problem solving technique that is borrowed from um, um, uh, participatory design methods. Um, those of you who have attended the design uh, thinking workshop, I think had a very good overview of one part of this, um, of this method. And this basically creates a bottom up solution space for everyone involved. But there's a catch. Because everyone is involved, there's a plethora of solutions. And these solutions sometimes are so inconceivable, they are so infeasible, and they're just like bad. But we hold on to them. But every now and then, there are certain solutions that come out that are so simple, so elegant, that we as a consultant company, we wouldn't even touch them. People would, impl people would implement those solutions right after the workshop immediately. So this gives them the power to create solutions that are applicable for them without having to interfere. Another thing that all consultants uh, are asked for is just making um, more time, you know, creating more time efficiency, making things work better, more work, work, uh, making employees more efficient. And most of the time, you ask for the timesheets or the project time logs to identify where things are. We don't do that. Instead, we conduct diary studies. We give every developer a small diary, and we ask them to record how their day went and how, like, what type of things that they did. And periodically, we check in with them to reflect on the, um, on the content, not necessarily just taking sums and say, hey, like, you, know, you work for 6.5 hours today. We look at the holistic picture and understand how their day is spent and what makes it hard for them to move faster. 
So these are some methods that we use for these two projects, and we're very happy with the results. For Ishbank, um, they were able to reconsider their entire approach to DevOps and um, change a few things around. They rattled a lot of silos, which was great for us, and then they decided to invest heavily in measurements and um, test automation as their next steps. For Huawei, they were able to craft a pipeline and a process simultaneously. And they worked closely with the process and the quality teams to work it into the corporate enterprise standards so that someone wouldn't come in and take it away from them. So, great results, everyone is happy, you know, beautiful things and whatever, but it's not very original. I mean, if you, if you enjoyed and found useful what I have shared, I'm glad. But the things that we use, I mean, look at these. The design methods, the design principles that we use, they have been used by designers for more than 50 years. And this is not the reason why I wanted to give this talk today. There are two takeaways that I would like you to remember, and that is why I wanted to give you this talk. The first one starts with this guy, the Kloya guy. Remember when I said we should use design methods to engage with our customers with the new project? My peers at Kloya said, well, we're not designers. And it's right, it's true. They are totally not designers. I mean, look at them. <laughs> this is like geekery and nerdery just all over the place. I'll, I'll give you two examples. Normal people keep their CVs like this, like maybe in, in a Word file, like a PDF or on LinkedIn. These guys code up their CVs and commit it to a Git repo. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Every Every year in March, they gather together and celebrate a birthday. You would think, well, you know, the CEO's birthday, right? Or like the founder's birthday. No, it's the Docker's birthday. <laughs> they make a cake for Docker. <laughs> then they gather around for this birthday party. They eat the cake and say like, high five. And then they sit down and do a tutorial on Docker. This is their understanding of a party. So these guys, <laughs> these guys are extreme geeks, and for certain, they're not designers. But it was these guys who were able to work with the clients with the methods that we mentioned, because they were willing to change their mindset. With just a little bit of training in simple design methods, they were able to go out to the field, empathize closely with the clients like they have never before, and they were able to turn their um, intake, their insights, into much more lasting solutions just because they were willing to change their mindset. The second takeaway that I wanted to share with you is about the DevOps community, actually. We, as the DevOps community, we are very good at coming up with solutions. We are very technical. We know where the bottlenecks are. We know how to identify them. We know how to optimize them. We know how to break things apart, put them together, measure them, improving them. We are very good at coming up with solutions. But sometimes, that is not enough. When your manager gives you grief because they don't understand you as a person, guess what? You can't dockerize them. And that is why sometimes you have to stop and just listen. Listen, not because someone is your client and not because someone is your peer or, or employee, but listen because they're a fellow human being. And when you can hear what they're saying to you with an open heart, without an agenda, only then you can go beyond setting up Docker to creating meaningful solutions and change for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Do we have time for questions? Yes. We have time for questions. Does anybody have a question? No? Excellent. <laughs> uh, let's, let's use the mic so we can uh, be helpful to us folks uh, who are listening on the live stream. I can't see where the question is, sorry. Oh, can somebody please pass it along? <laughs> I tried, I tried. It's soft, so I hope it doesn't hurt anyone. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Hear me? Here we go. 
So what about those free managers? You said uh, you're going to reveal something at the start of your talk? The fact that you can dockerize them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, Management okay. is, I mean, I, I have had the opportunity to manage um, many teams consisting of developers, designers, business analysts, and it is not as easy as it seems. So there is one thing that I should say, man, being a manager has a lot less to do with the technical abilities and a lot more to do with you know, listening and understanding and being there with the person that you're with. Um, there is not a technical solution to that. That is what I wanted to highlight. Cool, and uh, second question would be, uh, so did you end up Installing Jenkins for those guys or not? <laughs> I, I, I couldn't get the question, sorry. <laughs> did you end up installing Jenkins for that guy? <laughs> um, actually, it, we did in, in some of those. <laughs> At the end, it, we did. And Docker, and Kubernetes, and all that. The solution to all problems, right? Docker. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you please catch. pass along? Ooh, good catch. I thank you for the great talk. I really appreciated the, the human angle to things. I would like to ask about uh, user interface and user experience and tools. Mm -hmm. um, I hate two-part questions. Is there a difference between how we as a community of DevOps slash sysadmins slash whatever, what we need out of tools that is different from how so-called normal users need out of tools? <coughs> and to what extent is the hatred for Jenkins in its user interface insufficiency? To what extent is usability a real problem in tools for DevOps or other engineers? I'll, I'll, I'll hear two questions, so I'll answer them you know, slightly different in, in, in two parts. I'll start with Jenkins. Um, any command line tool or any tool that has difficulty in our understanding, um, because as a technical community, we don't have we have the higher um, uh, capacity to fix things and understand things. Most people don't just come up and say, hey, I protest this and I'm not gonna use that. So unfortunately, we kind of hurt ourselves by getting used to really bad interfaces, flows, logical you know, uh, structures within the tools that we use. Not about Jenkins, but there are many, many things that, um, that you know, fall into that space. Um, VI versus Emacs, completely different you know, approaches to the same task. Some of them is fit for others, some of them are just fit for others. So those are two different um, experiences. In terms of our first question, what you can do to create better user experiences is I'd say the first thing that I mentioned. Work directly with your users. People who are using the tool or the, whatever you're building, just spending quality time with them, asking one question, show me how you do this, and then listening would get you a lot of good insights. And this is the primary uh, fundamental piece of user research. Just asking a question, shutting up, and listening. And you can take it uh, from that point on. Anyone can do that with very simple training. So that would be a good starting point, I'd say. OK, we had another question somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your talk. It really resonated with me. So let's say that you are open-minded and wants to learn these things or become better in these things. Where would you start with learning? Is there a good resource that, 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 that people like us can get started with? Mm -hmm. um, there are many good um, resources for um, starting with um, user research and talking with, with users. I will post those um, um, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And a small plug, if you wait until next year, my book on user research is coming out. So if you want to take that, please do let me know. We have another question here. Ooh. Cool. Um, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, my point is, if I want to start small, and I will take those ideas, I really like to know about the, uh, the workshop, it's called the challenge uh, mm -hmm. ma mapping. Um, and you exposed two examples there, probably the the creme la creme, the, the great exams be the hot, great outputs. Now, my question is more to understand in the other projects that you guys actually work on, that the output was probably minor, although I understand that comparison to having a PDF, a report, and try to change the company is different when you have all this level of engagement with, mm -hmm. with everybody. So I believe that change is much willing to happen. 
Uh, my, uh, my question is more, cases you had w working with clients and the output wasn't great, what were, in your opinion, in overall, what were the, the, ste the things that actually didn't help? I there see. were blockers. Um, you are absolutely right in terms of any workshop or interactive method that the participants should be willing to at least contribute. They don't have to accept the final output, but at least they should be able to contribute. And uh, based on many, many um, years of bad learnings, we learned how to screen people who would be in those workshops, either by priming them ahead of time with a personal connection so that they understand the thing that we're trying to do. We're not trying to give an audit, we're not trying to fire them, we're not going to give them a scorecard to say like you're not doing this right this is about their own improvement and if they don't want to improve that is you know that is their take so we do a very careful screening of participants that should attend the workshop the rest is really a lot easier in terms of facilitation so that we have at least something that we can work with even if it's not 100 percent um, so that we can plan the, uh, the um, rest of the activities. I'd say, so we have worked with uh, maybe around 10 or so companies with this new method. I'd say the worst, worst, worst um, experience that we had was 70% complete. These were like 90 plus percent really involved our clients, um, really wanting to do some changes. But even with the clients who are like, so when are we going to set up Jenkins? We were able to screen the right people and work with them to get to a very high level around you know, 70s that gave us um, enough uh, material to work with. Uh, thanks. Uh, just a, another, it's like, it's so in comparison that we, as personas, we have managers and developers, and when we engage them to do a change, you, you, you needed both sides of the story at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this the willingness easier with developer or the operation sides, I mean, the people actually working on, on the things, and how is management taking that, okay, put here and explain what you're doing. H how is the willingness on those sides? From Equal? Based on our experience, it really changes based on the company culture. Um, there are some times where, you know, some companies are like, if someone above me says change, I'm gonna change. That is one, one way. There are other companies who are like, yay, like, you know, power to the people, we're going to change and we're going to topple our manager. And that's their culture. So it really changes among the cultures. If you stay flexible with your approach to understanding those, I think you can capture those both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Oops, I guess. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, you mentioned that we have to get engaged with the end users. And this is what I learned in school as well. It's everywhere. But the modern way of doing things right now, we have BA, we have product owners, we have scrum masters. All of them are here to separate the uh, understanding of business and the user away from the developers. Hmm. But at the same time, we need to get engaged with the users. How do we bridge this gap? I think that is the challenge of um, modern software practices nowadays. Um, some agile practices are good to solve those. I'd say among all of them, Scrum is the worst because Scrum is the agile method that says, you know, don't talk to anyone for two weeks. Just like, just do your code. And then after like someone is going to give you the designs and the designs are complete. As you said, there are BAs, you know, other people who may be thinking that they own a part of the pipeline, which is essentially micro waterfall all along. Um, there's absolutely nothing that says that any developer is just as qualified to talk to users as a trained product owner with design you know, background and years of experience. That is not what I mean. But the fact that they might have that experience should not block you from going with them or having contact with the end users so that you also get an understanding. Because the closer you are to the field of use, the better your understanding of experiences will be. And you will come up with, based on that particular contact, probably 10 ideas. Nine of them will be really bad, but one of them can be the solution that everyone is looking for. That is why I think it is very hard to establish that in a waterfall culture. That is very hard to establish that in a culture that says, oh, like, you know, we have to do scrum by the book and nothing else. So it's a part of that experimentation about roles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We're thank unfortunately you. out of time, but thanks again. <laughs>